My guest today has not given an interview in years, but he's ready to say a lot about gold now. He's a very familiar face in the commodity space. It's Peter Grandich of uh, petergrandich.com. He's also the author of Confessions of a Former Wall Street Whiz Kid. Peter Grandich, seven years since we last spoke? Yeah, you were my last secular, as I like to call it, media interview. And uh, quite frankly, and I'm not here to brown nose or anything, uh, one of the main reasons I came back is you're still, to me, one of the few real honorable financial journalists out there. So uh, wow. I, I don't mind doing <laughs> this at all. Well, thank you, Peter. You're giving me uh, goosebumps with that compliment. Thank you so much. I, I should almost call this week Blast from the Past. I had Frank Justra on yesterday. It had been two years. But, but you, it's been like, what, seven or eight years. Um, so... And I appreciate you coming out to Wall Street to, to speak with me today. But I want to know, you know, why, why are you coming out now to, to talk about gold again? Because you kind of, you took a step back from the industry, right? Sure. Uh, through 2013, I had spent 25 years. The main livelihood was working in the metals yeah, and mining I mean, industry. So many people love you still today. You have so many followers. That's why I'm, I'm happy for, for our viewers that are going to be so happy to see you. But... But what is it about gold's movement now that's making you feel feel good again about the space? Well, last year, for my greedy little self, because I don't work and promote for anybody or, or represent anything that, you know, if gold goes up, it profits from. This time last year, I made a personal decision, which I shared on my blog, that I turned very bearish on the equity market, sold all but one equity position, and put all, just basically all that was in a general portfolio into gold, gold-related investments like ETFs and some mining shares. And uh, that's why, by the way, when I listened to Frank Juster yesterday, which was a phenomenal interview, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Frank Juster just doesn't come out and do those things because yes. he's got nothing else to do. And other than maybe being on a different side of the political aisle, I couldn't agree with him more. In fact, when he talked about not owning any equity, saw this third phase, that's what I've been speaking about. Yep. And uh, you know, I even sent it out last night. Uh, Frank Juster's interview. That's well, how well I thought well, it was. Well, let, let, let's break it down. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you you also seen in three stages, and Frank had mentioned this yesterday. You had seen or predicted gold would be between 1350, 1400, then 1500, and then the third phase. Yeah, so last year ago when I, I, I used words like mega bull market, and at that time there weren't a lot of people, even the old hard asset community or whatever's left of it, you know, moved on to cryptocurrencies and pot stocks. So there, there were still a few old people that always talked about gold, but basically it was hard to find some really long-term bullish gold outlooks. My feeling was that we were going to break through this 1350, 1400 that kept it in the trading range for a few years. It would run to 1500. That would be the second phase. Around 1500 either side, and I don't know how many days, weeks, or months it would take, it would be the last line of battle, I called it, of the remaining gold bears. Let's not forget, there were a lot of gold bears a year ago. A year ago, words like relic and stuff like that oh, yeah. was tossed around. I've always told people that in the mainstream media, gold is kryptonite to financial mm -hmm. assets. You're just not going to turn on the right. so-called other financial networks and hear a lot of positive things about it. But they would make one last line of defense, and once we got through the 1500 or so, I really thought we were going to be in the third and most exciting phase. It'll be more volatile. It won't be a straight line like it's been the last three months. But I've said we're going to go to a new nominal new high. We'll be somewhere as over 2,000 in less than three years. So when Frank spoke about that, and he even talked, and even though I know he doesn't like to mention numbers, you almost got 5,000 out of him. <laughs> but, uh, a lot of people heard that. Yeah. yeah. But... Uh, Obviously, I agree with him that we're going to see a more explosive, more volatile. And that's simply because so long as the stock, one thing you don't want to do if you're a gold bull, you don't want to see a stock market crash because too much money be lost and not be able to kind of switch over. I think there'll be more of a rollover in the stock market. I wrote a report early this uh, late spring, early summer that I don't believe there's going to be another gold, I'm sorry, general equity bull market mm. in my lifetime. And if I'm right and we just kind of roll over and just some of that money gets into the gold market, it's really explosive. Look, the gold market for a lot of years has been beaten up. It's, there's, there's not a lot of new deposits that are going to come onto the market anytime soon, even if gold went to 2000 tomorrow. There's not a lot of people that have been playing it. There's not a lot of people that have stuck with it. A lot of the cleansing has been done. And now that we broke through that resistance where everybody said, oh, until it does, 
It's a whole new ball game. If you said if it's a nine inning game, we're at best in the second inning of this bull market. Wow. Okay, well, okay, I have so many other questions now for you. Okay, first, if you do hear talk of $5,000 gold, is that crazy for you or actually a number that gold could get to? Well, I, I, I think Frank was feeling the same way yesterday. I don't want to be in the regular world if we're 5,000 in the next okay. year or two. For gold to trade at such a level, there would be such dire consequences in the world, socially, politically, economically. Now listen, I have stated for well over a year that America has entered its worst ever social, political, and economic era. Politically, it's hard to argue that things have not been worse politically. There is no more middle. People either hate a person or love a person. Socially, there's a clear movement in the United States, whether you like it or not, to left side thinking. Economically, because the market's kind of held together, even though it hasn't gone anywhere for almost 18 months, we haven't seen that, but we're now seeing the economic things turn negative. Negative interest rates, if I can say one thing. When I started in the business 35 years ago, the first product they gave me to sell was a 10-year CD <laughs> with a 15% interest rate, and people hung up on me saying the interest rate was too low, and by the way, are you gonna give me a toaster like uh. the banks used to give us toasters? <laughs> Oh. Negative interest rates. I don't yeah. think people understand it. But here's the untold story yet that's going to be in the media in the next 12 to 18 months. We do a lot of long-term planning for people. We're not asset. We're not, I'm not a stock guy anymore. I don't try to beat the stock market. Anymore. The reason it's called former Wall Street whiz kid now is because after you make and lose millions more than once, you shouldn't call yourself a whiz kid to believe, believe it. But in planning, there's an old 4% rule, Canada, U.S., whatever. I need to earn 4% when I retire, so it'll replenish enough, and I go, well, if we're going to zero or below zero, how do you do planning? There's no interest rate return. What do people do? And that's one of the reasons now that people are going into far more riskier stuff, but it's been a tremendous benefit for gold because people realize the only thing that's gonna happen is currencies are gonna be devalued, and that's when gold shines. Gold has always been and will always been for 2,000 years will continue an alternative to paper money. So, so you said you're, you're basically all in gold now, but how, how is your exposure? Is it physical? And, and I know you don't want to name mining stocks if you are in mining stocks, um, but, but how are you exposed to the metal? I, I still treat it as a capital appreciation. I'm not owning it because I think one day I'll get, be able to get a loaf of bread when there's blood in the okay. streets. I'm not into any of that okay. type of stuff. I think physical bullionship is always first and paramount. I think it's misrepresentative for investment people to say, well, own an ETF, it's just like physical bullion. It's not. You need to have physical bullion. How you do that through bars, whatever, we'll leave that to the experts like Kitco and so forth and so on. After that, then I believe things like ETFs. One of the problems that the mining industry is gonna have or has is the junior end or the lower end of the place it's become very difficult. Not only have the players that used to play it gone on to other things, it's very difficult now with 60% of all capital in equity markets in passive funds. There's not as many people willing to look at those little juniors and, and, and look for drill, you know, drill results and things of that nature. So realistically, other than from development up, it's gonna be very, very hard to play expiration stocks. I think that's gonna be a real challenge no matter what the gold price does. Mm -hmm. Now I do think when we get to a, a, a level, and it's probably near or above one of those new nominal highs, then everything's gonna go. But until that time, I think it's physical bullion first, a diversified or use ETF uh, for uh, majors and significant producers, and then you're gambling in total speculative money on, on junior resource stocks. Do you, are you just in gold, or do you like silver? Do you like any of the other metals? I own a little bit of silver, and I know that, you know, especially retail people always like quantity over quality, but gold is still the main assets. It's still being considered as an alternative when it comes to monetary. So I think it's gold first, then silver second. Plus, silver tends to still be more of an industrial commodity where gold is really what it's always been for 2,000 years. It's an alternative to paper What currencies. do you say to people who, are, who, who might say to you, Peter, how can you be all in gold? How, how are you hedging? How are you protecting yourself? Shouldn't you be more diversified? Well, let me start with my wife who said that to me a year ago. <laughs> and, and I um, did not speak to her before the interview. No, but she was the first of many that said that. 
Yeah, there is an old common thing. I viewed it simply as a capital appreciation. Listen, there's people that are 90% long general equities. Why? They say, well, there's enough diversification. Listen, I believed a year ago, hindsight after 2020, that gold was gonna outperform the equity market. It has, I was fortunate, blessed, lucky, whatever anybody wants to call. Should most people do that? No, but for me, it, 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 it worked. For others, right. it may not. And one thing I always like to talk to people now about, you may have the financial wherewithal to take risk, but one thing all of financial service industry still does a poor job of, and even I did it in my early years, we don't understand the risk of mental anguish. Mm. And so the moment any thought that enters, boy, if I own 60% of my portfolio, my wife's going to kill me, that's your message not to be 60% long anything. It's the mental risk that people can't get over. A lot of people can afford financial, but losing what it does to them mentally really, really upsets their oh, entire life. Peter, do we enter a recession in, in 2020? I think in some ways we're already in one. Uh, I think what you're going to see, we already saw a change in the employment numbers ratcheted it way down than what they first reported. I think uh, my biggest concern, and I'm not here to discuss politics, when I was hired 35 years ago, my first sales manager said, if you want to be successful as a stockbroker, don't mention politics, religion, or other men's <laughs> wives. Well, I still talk about politics and religion a lot because of where my faith has taken me, but I will tell you this. I've grown very concerned about Trump for one reason, and not for all it. He has bet the ranch on the performance of the stock market to measure how well he's doing. And last week, in my opinion, he resorted to fibbing or something worse about a so-called calls that really, when he said the Chinese called us and yeah. they want to talk, and everybody in China said, what call? Right. My feeling is he's gone too far into the market being a sign of performance, and it's still too far away from the election that if the market does turn down and stay down, I think as it always does, the economy and markets impact more than anything about collusion and all the other stuff that people were hopping him on. And I think he made a grave mistake tying himself to the stock market in the manner that he has. Interesting. Peter, I want to also just talk a little bit about um, what you do outside of or what you did outside of gold and metals is you do a lot of work with sports. Uh, I think you're, you're living the dream of, of many viewers out there. You get to work with a lot of football stars and hockey stars and sure, advise them financially. Sure, sorry. Back in 2001, I formed, I was a diehard Jet fan, and it's ironic because the guy that I formed it with was on the first two Giants Super Bowl team. <laughs> and then the second guy through my door was another running back from the Giants. But you're right, uh, almost for 20 years now, and in the last five or six while I was still working the metals, it was part of my livelihood, but it's really my sole livelihood. I do really just, and have a team of retirement and uh, estate planning. We're not asset managers. We don't believe you can beat the stock market. Uh, Nobel laureates have showed studies that 80% of money managers underperform an index, so we don't think we're gonna beat that 20%. We also work with business owners on how to exit their business, but there's a separate company where I do all of that for professional athletes, and currently we still have about 19 NFL and uh, hockey clients, and then we have a whole bunch of retired guys that we deal with. Do you think you're going to become more vocal now in the gold space? People miss you. Well, let me the tell fans. you something, and, and I say this, and you know off stage, I am not here to start a new career yeah. and all. If more people were like you in the business versus that I used to run into, I would. But I, I really think God has me in a place where I'm to be at. But would I still find time for folks like yourself? I yes, I would. Well, I wish you a luck, but you feel good about about the space right now. which Yeah, I, I, like I said, and I agree with Frank, we're in the most... We're going to be in the most volatile one, but this is going to be the most explosive, and I really think gold will make a, a nominal new high. And we say nominal because it doesn't adjust for inflation, but I think we're going to have a 2,000-something in gold before this all ends. Peter, um, thank you so much. I know it was a big uh, trek for you to come out to the studio today, so I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me, and I wish you uh, luck in whatever path you, you continue down. God bless you, Daniel, yeah. and God bless your listening Thank audience. you so much. Peter Grandich in studio with me today. Stay tuned to Kiko.com. We'll have much more for you.